Someone I want to see. My friend, Sherlock Holmes. It's 221B Baker Street. Hello there. Welcome to my review of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, Series 2, Episode 1, The Copper Beaches. This is yet another classic and relatively well-known Sherlock story that begins in the familiar way for the series by presenting us with a mystery. A man climbs the fortified walls of a country estate, only to be chased off by an enormous dog, while the residents inside remain largely unaware. We then find ourselves in the comfort of Baker Street. Holmes is in a melancholic mood, grumpy with Watson for how he has been recounting their adventures to the public, which then puts Watson in a foul mood. Holmes laments the fact that Watson makes the focus of the stories the crime and not the importance of how the crime is solved. In attempting to put colour and life into each of your statements, instead of confining yourself to placing upon a record that severe reasoning from cause to effect, which is really the only notable feature about the thing. This is a new direction for the series, as in series one we saw their friendship grow and evolve, but here the honeymoon period is over, and they both are having issues with each other. Holmes remains calm, while Watson is more animated, reflecting their differing personalities. It would be easy to say Holmes is dismissive of the public, who enjoy Watson's stories, as being too stupid to appreciate his genius, but I don't think that's what he's suggesting. I think he's disappointed that they aren't more interested in improving themselves and learning from him. Which you could argue is a bit egotistical and classist as they are likely hard at work while he sits in his room enjoying a pipe having benefited from a private education. But it's ultimately revealing that what he really wants is a criminal enterprise that will give him more of a challenge. The days of the great cases are past. Man, or at least criminal man, has lost all enterprise and originality. As his recent cases have been too easy to solve and too mundane. His biggest internal issue has always been his inability to deal with boredom, and this is entirely a display of that. But it also introduces what will be the plot of this mystery. Dear Mr Holmes, I am very anxious to consult you as to whether I should or should not accept a situation which has been offered to me as a governess. Little realising what a challenge this will bring. From a storytelling point of view, this is a simple means to an end to keep the story moving and have an excuse to show the two in Baker Street before the story really starts. But from a character perspective, it reinforces just how tortured Holmes is as a character. This is something that is not often shown in adaptations. There may be a nod to it here and there, but Holmes' fear of the mundane is highlighted much more in these versions. He is a flawed hero, who should be admired but not worshipped. It's more complicated than that. Speaking of complicated, Miss Violet Hunter, the governess who has engaged Holmes, has arrived. Played by the late Natasha Richardson in a very early role, Holmes is openly hostile towards her at first not understanding why she's come to him with such a trivial matter as to whether to take a job or not. But she pays this no heed and she tells him the circumstances surrounding her conundrum. His hostility lifts the moment she mentions she has no friends or family to consult. As I have no parents or relations of any sort from whom I could ask advice, I thought perhaps you would be kind enough to tell me what I should do. 
I shall be happy to serve you in any way I can. For all his cantankerousness, he is still a considerate man when he's reminded to be, arguably due to Watson's influence on him over the course of the first series. She explains that she was recently offered a position via an agency to work for a Mr. Rucastle, who we meet via flashback, play to perfection, by Joss Ackland. He manages to balance a jovial outward appearance with a dangerousness and creepiness to perfection. That will do. He is thrilled by Miss Hunter and is willing to offer her a hundred pounds a year, more than double her last salary. What I really like is how prescient Doyle was in his writing concerning money. A modern audience has no context for how much a hundred pound a year is in today's money, certainly not for what is now an incredibly niche job, but knowing that it's twice as much as you could reasonably expect to earn gives some much needed context. The job is in a country house, the Copper Beaches, in Hampshire looking after one child and tending to his wife's whims, expressed in a sinister way that sets off a small alarm bell in Violet's head. Well, your duty would be, as I'm sure your good sense would suggest, to obey any little commands that my wife might give. You said commands. It is then that he tells her that to take the position she must be willing to cut her hair short, which she refuses to do, even after the agency threatened to take her off their books. She explains to Holmes that she is very protective of her somewhat rare hair colour and type, giving Watson the chance to gently flirt with her. And most artistic, if I may so observe. This is something downplayed in the series, as Watson is much older in these adaptations than he is in the books, so it's greatly toned down, which I think is appropriate, but still nice to hint towards his original character every now and then. Violet then explains she received a letter from Rue Castle asking her to reconsider for an additional £20 a year for the inconvenience and as she was already having second thoughts about refusing the job, she has consulted Holmes about whether to take it or not. Holmes offers the wisdom of Solomon. My dear Miss Hunter, as your mind is already made up, the matter is settled. But if she has any concerns when she's taken up the post, she can call on him at any time. Once she's gone, Watson asks Holmes what he thinks, and Holmes says that if it were his own sister, he would not allow her to take the post. This line of dialogue is curious, as he clearly senses that there could be some danger involved here, yet he allows her to proceed. Is he doing it because he senses a mystery, and is more concerned with that than her safety? Possibly. Does he believe that he can prevent any harm that might come to her? Less likely, as he has been too slow to prevent tragedy before. My interpretation is that he knows she's strong-willed, and that even if he told her not to take the job, she probably would anyway. So better that she goes with his blessing, knowing that he is there if she needs him and that she should be on her guard. She does cut her hair with a hint of regret and holds on to the tresses she's removed. Then she's off to the Copper Beaches where she's introduced to Rue Castle's manservant Toller and his wife as well as the child she will care for. Who charmingly presents her with a dead bird that he's shot. Rue Castle then shows her the grounds, including the huge guard dog we saw in the prologue, and warns her not to go out at night. 
under no pretext, set foot across the threshold at night. It's as much as your life is worth. <laughs> she inquires about the fads and fancies Rucastle has hinted at, and he explains his wife expects her to wear a blue dress that they will provide. She then meets Mrs. Rucastle, who seems relatively normal. How do you do, Miss Hunter? I'm sorry I was not here to greet you. A slight indisposition. The episode is doing a really good job of balancing the level and safety and danger which Violet feels she's in, with a combination of relative normalcy and unusual behaviour that could easily be explained away as benign eccentricity, or could be something deeply sinister. And all of this comes from Ackland's performance as Rue Castle up to this point. It would be interesting to see if the story works as well if Rue Castle was played completely sinister or completely friendly. Because I think Ackland gets it just right. But I would be interesting to see other interpretations. There are more sinister goings on as Violet finds her ponytail in one of her bedroom drawers, only to find that it isn't hers at all. Hers is still in her case. This is enough to spook her sufficiently to call on Holmes and Watson, and they're on the next train to Hampshire. Watson wonders what the hell is going on, and Holmes explains he has seven workable theories but won't edge towards one in particular without more data. This is a classic window into how Sherlock Holmes works. He formulates as many possible solutions as he can, and the more data he has provided, the more theories he can eliminate, like he's playing a real version of Guess Who. He also exclaims that he sees the countryside as a hotbed of the worst possible crimes. Not necessary that there are less crimes in the city, but that the crimes of the country are far more terrifying because of their isolation. Having grown up in a semi-rural village, I can confirm that this is absolutely true. Upon arrival, they meet Violet in a pub, and along with the hair-raising story, she explains what else has given her cause to call on them. On the first day she was required to wear the blue dress, she was asked to sit in a window seat facing into the room for around an hour, while Rue Castle decides to entertain her with a series of what she thought were hilarious anecdotes. Two days later, this performance was repeated. The next time this was repeated, she took a small section of mirror with her to see what was happening behind her, and saw a bearded man watching them, the man from the prologue. Mrs. Rucastle spots this and tells the husband. Not about Violet's actions, but about the man, who Rucastle insists my Violet must shoo away. After that, she was not required to go through this routine again. Holmes deduces that this is not the end of her story, and she goes on to explain that there's a turreted room in the house with a locked door. One day, Tola left the door open, so she took the opportunity to explore, only to discover another locked door that appeared to have someone behind it. This scared her, causing her to flee and run into Rue Castle, who seems to offer comfort and the explanation he uses it as a dark room for his photography hobby, but then threatens to throw her to the dog. And if you ever set foot across that threshold again, I'll throw you to the Mastiff. <laughs> it was this threat that prompted her to call on Holmes. Based on what she's told him, he formulates a plan, but it 
requires her to put herself in potential danger, even though he's more than confident that she is capable. I would not ask this of you, Miss Hunter, if I did not think you were quite exceptional. Back at the Copper Beaches, with the Rue Castles gone for the day, and the child sent to play with a friend, she enacts the plan. While Mr Toller is dead drunk, she calls on Mrs Toller to tell her she can't find the boy and thinks he might be locked in the cellar. When Mrs Toller goes to investigate, Violet locks her in the cellar. While this is happening, separate to this, the bearded intruder has also re-entered the grounds, and climbs up to the turreted tower from the outside of the house, breaking in to the shock of a young lady. Good God, what was that? A young lady with short hair, wearing a blue dress, she screams, and Holmes and Watson arrive and rush to investigate the scene with Violet. Rue Castle returns and catches the three of them in the turreted room, mistaking Violet for his daughter Alice, and upon realising, thinking that they are responsible for kidnapping her. He locks them in and rushes to unleash his dog. They manage to get out but are too slow to prevent the dog from savaging Rue Castle. After Watson has shot the poor dog to prevent the attack becoming fatal, Watson tends to Rue Castle's injuries and Mrs Toller is now ready to explain what has been going on. Alice was Rue Castle's daughter from his first marriage and wasn't happy when he remarried, but things became worse when she began courting the bearded man, as Alice was entitled to her late mother's inheritance. When there was a chance of her husband coming forward, who would ask for all that law would give him? Well, then her father thought it time to put a stop on it. At which point Rue Castle would lose access to that money. His insistence that she signed over her money to him gave her what they call brain fever, but what we would probably understand as depression. As a result of this, she cut her hair short and Rue Castle locked her in the turret, apparently for her own safety. He then hired Violet to act as a decoy to get rid of Alice's persistent fiancé. And that's where our story began. The episode ends with a prologue about Alice marrying her fiancé, Rue Castle surviving but as a shell of a man, and Violet gaining a good job as the head of a school. This is a really action-packed finale and a fast-paced episode in general, perhaps the most action-packed we've seen so far and really requires Mrs. Toller exposition at the end, although it would have been nice perhaps if Holmes had been more a part of that conversation, as it's not entirely clear if he had worked out any of it. It's also quite a convoluted story, the basics being Rue Castle drove Alice mad so he could get a hold of her money, but he's a little more tied to the politics and law of Victorian England that might have done with the kind of explanation we had about Violet's salary. It's very sad that Watson had to shoot the poor dog as a way to make sure Rue Castle got some comeuppance, but I appreciate why that's more dramatic than just having him caught. It would also have been nice if they had gone into why the young Rue Castle was such a horrible child a bit more. In the original story, it's explained in more detail that he's quite the psychopath in training as he tortures small animals. But maybe that might have been over-egging the pudding as it's not really relevant to the plot. Maybe it would have made more dramatic sense if he'd been the one savaged by the dog, but 
I'd have been even more upset about Watson shooting it if that had happened. The only other thing to say is that as Rue Castle was not arrested, merely left to haunt his manor house as the psychologically traumatised figure, I have to assume that he didn't actually do anything illegal for the time. Certainly by today's standards it's false imprisonment at the very least, but apparently driving somebody into a depression then locking them up because of it was not so bad back then. Perhaps Alice should have been called Rebecca. Despite the few flaws I've pointed out, this is still a very enjoyable story and this is an excellent adaptation, although it suffers slightly from Holmes not really doing that much deduction, other than he knows something bad is happening. It's a tight, fast-paced script, all the actors are pulling their weight, and it looks absolutely gorgeous, with the location managers doing another excellent job. For me, this is easily 4 out of 5. Thank you. Goodbye.